The world was a dark place following the Islamic terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. Islamic terrorists were slaughtering thousands of people every year in the name of Allah. Al-Qaeda terrorists took refuge in Afghanistan, which was controlled by Taliban terrorists. The vast majority of the worst, least safe places in the world for women and girls were Muslim-majority countries, and yet politicians and journalists and educators and entertainers were convinced that their primary purpose in life was to defend the fake prophet who gave rise to this endless cycle of violence, oppression, and cruelty. Here we are, 20 years and 40,000 Islamic terrorist attacks later, and Islamic terrorists are still slaughtering thousands of people every year in the name of Allah. Al-Qaeda terrorists are still in Afghanistan, which is still controlled by Taliban terrorists, although the Taliban terrorists are much better equipped now, and ISIS terrorists are there as well. The vast majority of the worst least safe places in the world for women and girls are still Muslim-majority countries, and yet politicians and journalists and educators and entertainers are still convinced that their primary purpose in life is to defend the fake prophet who gave rise to this endless cycle of violence, oppression, and cruelty. Since it's the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks, this would be a good time to discuss what everyone should have learned over the past 20 years, but didn't. And just in case anyone didn't believe me when I said that there have been 40,000 Islamic terrorist attacks since 9-11, I'll list them on the screen while I'm talking. This list is courtesy of TheReligionOfPeace.com. We'll start with the terrorist attacks that occurred in 2001 after the 9-11 attacks. I apologize for the rapid scrolling, but this is how fast we need to go if we want to go through 40,000 Islamic terrorist attacks in a single video. If you want specifics, you can always slow down the video. Keep in mind, there is no looping here. There are no repeats. All of the attacks flashing before your eyes are specific Islamic terrorist attacks. Now, the basics. The word Islam means submission. In its religious context, it refers to submission to Allah. But Islam doesn't just tell you that you must submit to Allah. It tells you how you must submit to Allah. You submit to Allah by unquestioningly obeying the commands of Allah and Muhammad. Surah 33, verse 36 of the Quran. It is not fitting for a believer, man or woman, when a matter has been decided by Allah and his messenger to have any option about their decision. If anyone disobeys Allah and his messenger, he is indeed on a clearly wrong path. When a matter has been decided by Allah and Muhammad, believers have no option but obedience. Surah 4, verse 65. But know, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. Muslims can have no real faith until they make Muhammad their judge in all disputes and they find in themselves no resistance against his decisions. Fortunately, understanding what Allah commands shouldn't be very difficult because the Quran claims to be perfectly clear in its commands. Surah 11 verse 1. This is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection, and then they have been expounded in detail. Surah 12, verse 1. These are verses of the clear book. Surah 15, verse 1. These are the verses of the book and of a Quran that makes things clear. Surah 24, verse 46. Certainly we have revealed clear communications. Surah 26, verse 2. These are the verses of the book that makes things clear. Surah 27, verse 1, these are verses of the Quran, a book that makes things clear. Surah 28, verse 2, these are verses of the book that makes things clear. Surah 57, verse 9, he it is who sends down clear communications upon his servant that he may bring you forth from utter darkness into light. Allah, according to the Quran, means exactly what he says. But there's a problem. Because we go to the Quran and we find verses that seem to be saying different things. Surah 8, verse 61. 
But if they incline to peace, you also incline to it and put your trust in Allah. That sounds like peace is the goal. Then we read Surah 47, verse 35. Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace when you should be uppermost. Here, dominating unbelievers is the goal, and Muslims aren't to seek peace when they're supposed to be uppermost. Now, if Allah's commands are perfectly clear, why do they change from one revelation to the next? The polytheists of Mecca asked this very question, and Allah eventually clarified the matter in Surah 2, verse 106. Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? This verse explains the Islamic doctrine of abrogation. Allah abrogates or cancels certain verses by revealing new verses. So Islam has a simple method for interpreting the Quran. If two verses are in conflict, figure out which one came later and that one abrogates the earlier verse. With this framework in mind, we're now in a position to understand all of the conflicting verses on peace and violence in the Quran by considering how these revelations unfolded during the life of Muhammad. And here we find that jihad proceeds in stages according to the status of Muslims in a society. Let's go through the three stages of jihad. Stage one. When Muhammad and his followers were only a tiny minority of the population, they were commanded to preach a message of peace and tolerance. If a Muslim had a disagreement with a polytheist, he was simply to say, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. At this stage, Muslims weren't allowed to fight even to defend themselves against persecution. What's interesting, however, is that even though Muhammad was outwardly preaching a message of peace and tolerance, behind closed doors, he was already plotting to conquer Arabia and other lands. One day, some of Muhammad's tribesmen went to his uncle Abu Talib because they wanted to arrange a truce with Muhammad. They wanted Muhammad to stop criticizing their beliefs. Watch how Muhammad responds in the History of at tabari Volume 6. Abu Talib sent for the Messenger of Allah, and when he came in, he said, Nephew, here are the sheikhs and nobles of your tribe. They have asked for justice against you, that you should desist from reviling their gods, and they will leave you to your god. Uncle, he said, shall I not summon them to something which is better for them than their gods? What do you summon them to, he asked. He replied, I summon them to utter a saying through which the Arabs will submit to them, and they will rule over the non-Arabs. Abu Jahal said from among the gathering, What is it by your father? We will give you it and ten like it. He answered that you should say, There is no deity but Allah. Muhammad tells his tribe, Become Muslims and we'll rule over the Arabs and the non-Arabs. We can use the Shahada, there is no God but Allah, to make people submit to us. Why is Muhammad walking around Mecca calling for peace and tolerance while in secret, he's trying to build an army and conquer the world. Well, Allah later cleared this up by revealing Surah 3, verse 28. Let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoso doeth that hath no connection with Allah, unless it be that you but guard yourselves against them, taking, as it were, security. Don't be friends with non-Muslims unless it's to guard yourselves against them. Ibn Kathir, the most respected Muslim commentator of all time, explains the meaning of this verse as follows. Unless you indeed fear a danger from them, meaning except those believers who in some areas or times fear for their safety from the disbelievers. In this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship to the disbelievers outwardly but never inwardly. For instance, al-Bukhari recorded that Abu Darda said, We smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. Al-Bukhari said that al-Hasan said, Takiya is allowed until the day of resurrection. Here we have the Islamic doctrine of Takiya, which takes different forms in different situations, but in this context refers to Muhammad and his companions 
pretending to be friendly towards unbelievers in order to protect the Muslim community while Muhammad was plotting to conquer and subjugate the unbelievers. This is stage one, stealth jihad. Stage two, when Muhammad had gained a larger following and had formed alliances with various tribes, but wasn't yet strong enough to subjugate the unbelievers, he was ordered to wage defensive jihad. At this stage, Muslims are ordered to fight unbelievers, but only if the unbelievers do something first. A characteristic passage here is Surah 2, verses 190 to 193. And fight in the way of Allah with those who fight with you, and do not exceed the limits. Surely Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. And kill them wherever you find them, and drive them out from whence they drove you out, and persecution is severer than slaughter. And do not fight with them at the sacred mosque until they fight with you in it. But if they do fight you, then slay them. Such is the recompense of the unbelievers. But if they desist, then surely Allah is forgiving, merciful. And fight with them until there is no persecution and religion should be only for Allah. But if they desist, then there should be no hostility except against the oppressors. So, there's fighting in stage two, but the fighting is a response to persecution or oppression or even criticism. Many Muslims in the West insist that this is the end of the story. Fighting is only for self-defense. But the revelations continued to change as the Muslim community expanded. Stage three, when Muhammad and his followers became the most powerful force in Arabia, they were commanded to wage offensive jihad, violently subjugating non-Muslims simply for being non-Muslims. Surah 9 verse 29 of the Quran commands Muslims to fight those who believe not in Allah. Notice, this doesn't say fight those who fight you. That was stage two. This verse tells Muslims to fight people based on their beliefs. Surah 9, verse 73, O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Strive hard against whom? Oppressors? Persecutors? People who are attacking you? No, strive hard against the unbelievers, non-Muslims, and the hypocrites, people who claim to be Muslims but aren't fully submitting to the commands of Allah and Muhammad. Surah 9, verse 123, O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Surah 48 verse 29, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. The distinction in these verses isn't between people who are attacking you and people who aren't attacking you. The distinction at stage three is between believer and unbeliever, and those who are with Muhammad are only to be merciful towards fellow Muslims. Now, the most common response to violent Quran passages is the context defense. Surely, David, you must be taking these verses out of context. Well, let's look at the context of one of these commands. Generally, when we're referring to the context of a Quran verse, we either mean the historical context, what was happening when it was revealed, or the literary context, the other verses in the passage. Let's go through the historical and literary contexts of Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who believe not in Allah. Ibn Kathir gives us the historical context. After Muhammad conquered Mecca, he eventually told the polytheists of Arabia that they could no longer take the religious pilgrimage to the Kaaba, which they had been doing for centuries. Members of Muhammad's tribe, the Quraysh, were upset because they earned a lot of money from their dealings with the polytheists. Here's what happened. Allah, Most High, ordered the believers to prohibit the disbelievers from entering or coming near the sacred mosque. On that, Quraysh thought that this would reduce their profits from trade. Therefore, Allah, Most High, compensated them and ordered them to fight the people of the book until they embrace Islam or pay the jizya, which is tribute money. 
Ibn Kathir then quotes Surah 9 verses 28 to 29 as Allah's response to their concerns, and he concludes by saying, Therefore, the Messenger of Allah decided to fight the Romans in order to call them to Islam. According to the historical context, Surah 9 verse 29, fight those who believe not in Allah, was revealed because Muhammad's tribe was wondering how they were going to make money. And after receiving the revelation, Muhammad decided to fight the Romans in order to call them to Islam. If the Romans converted, they would pay zakat. If they didn't, they would pay jizya. Either way, fighting them would lead to revenue for the Meccans. What about the literary context? The passage begins at verse 28 and goes through verse 33. Let's read the entire passage to see if we can find anything about self-defense. Verse 28, O you who believe, truly the pagans are unclean, so let them not, after this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if you fear poverty, soon will Allah enrich you, if he wills, out of his bounty, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. How is Allah going to enrich them? Next verse. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. But why fight Jews and Christians? Aren't we believers too? Next verse. And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before. Allah's curse be upon them how they are turned away. So Jews and Christians aren't real monotheists. Have we done anything else? Next verse. They took their rabbis and their monks to be their lords besides Allah and Christ, the son of Mary. Yet they were commanded to worship but one God. There is no God but he. Praise and glory to him. Far is he from having the partners they associate with him. Any other reason to fight us? Next verse. They desire to put out the light of Allah with their mouths. Notice it says with their mouths, not by the sword. This is referring to what we say. But Allah will not allow but that his light should be perfected, even though the unbelievers may detest it. Allah won't allow Jews and Christians to spread our false beliefs through preaching. But how is Allah going to stop us? Next verse. It is he who hath sent his messenger, Muhammad, with guidance and the religion of truth, Islam, to prevail it over all religion, even though the idolaters may detest it. How is Islam going to prevail? Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who believe not in Allah until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, that's the entire passage. Where's the part about self-defense? Show me one word about self-defense. Every criterion for fighting Jews and Christians in this passage has to do with our beliefs. If Allah is trying to say, only fight in self-defense, this is a very strange way of putting it. If Allah says, fight those who do not believe, when he really means only fight people who are attacking you, he most certainly is not the perfectly clear communicator he repeatedly claims to be in the Quran. Putting all of this together, Islam means submission. You submit to Allah by unquestioningly obeying the commands of Allah and Muhammad. Allah claims that his commands are perfectly clear, so there isn't much room for reinterpretation. Later revelations abrogate or cancel earlier revelations, so quoting peaceful verses doesn't work if they've been abrogated. Applying this method to the Quran, we find that jihad proceeds in stages. When Muhammad couldn't hope to win a physical confrontation with the unbelievers, he promoted peace and tolerance outwardly while plotting in secret to conquer the unbelievers. When his numbers increased, he began fighting unbelievers, but only defensively. When he became the most powerful force in Arabia, he began systematically subjugating unbelievers. What I find most fascinating about all this is that you can pick any country in the world and it will reflect the three-stage pattern laid down by Muhammad. In countries like the United States, 
where Muslims make up a small minority of the population, the message of Islam is peace and tolerance. In countries where Muslims are strong enough to fight, but not strong enough to dominate, violence often erupts over any perceived provocation. And where Muslims are the most powerful group, as they are in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, religious minorities are violently oppressed, or at best, they're second-class citizens. Why? Because that was the pattern established by Muhammad in Surah 33, verse 21 of the Quran, says that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. Now, just so no one misunderstands me, I'm only talking about what Islam teaches and how these teachings rise to the surface in various ways around the world. I'm not talking about what individual Muslims believe. I'm not talking about what your Muslim friends believe. Individual Muslims are often quite ignorant of what their prophet taught, and even knowledgeable Muslims are frequently quite happy to reinterpret all the words of Allah that they don't like. Unfortunately for the reinterpreters, Allah doesn't leave much room for reinterpretation. As we've seen, Allah claims that his commands are perfectly clear, and he commands his followers to fight those who do not believe in him, at least when they're strong enough to win. But since reinterpreting the Quran is so common, especially in the West, let me address those of you who reinterpret the Quran and claim that Islam is a religion of peace. When people like me quote Islam's most trusted sources and show that Islam calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world, you call us racists and Islamophobes. The reason you're convinced that people who criticize Islam are racists and Islamophobes goes something like this. Since there's no connection between Islam and terrorism, anyone who thinks there's a connection between Islam and terrorism must be delusional. The source of this delusion can only be hatred or bigotry. So anyone who's critical of Islam must be a racist and an Islamophobe. At this point, we could just pay attention to the list of terrorist attacks in front of us, or we could go through Islam's greatest scholars through the centuries and point out that it isn't just non-Muslims who are claiming that Islam calls for the violent subjugation of the world. It's many Muslims themselves. But let's pretend that all of the Muslims who are carrying out these terrorist attacks and all of Islam's greatest scholars through the centuries somehow completely misunderstood what Islam teaches. Let's pretend, for the sake of argument, that you're right and that Islam is actually a religion of peace. Please tell me, what's the difference, practically speaking, between, on the one hand, a religion that commands its adherents to violently subjugate unbelievers, and, on the other hand, a religion that only sounds like it commands its adherents to violently subjugate unbelievers? In other words, what's the difference between a religion that commands fight those who do not believe in Allah and really means it, and a religion that commands fight those who do not believe in Allah, but doesn't really mean it. In both religions, there are going to be people who obey the command, either because the religion really commands it, or because the religion sounds like it commands it. And in both religions, there are going to be large numbers of people who don't obey the command because they don't take it very seriously. Either way, people are being brutally killed. So, why is a religion that's actually peaceful but sounds violent to many of its adherents somehow less of a threat than a religion that sounds violent because it is? If your religion is theoretically peaceful but for all practical purposes is completely indistinguishable from a religion of violence, oppression, and cruelty, why would a person be a bigot for expressing concerns about the spread of your religion? One more question. Assuming that Islam is actually peaceful, but only sounds violent due to all the misunderstood but otherwise crystal clear commands to violently subjugate non-Muslims, what do you propose to do about the Muslims who are carrying out the attacks on this list? What do you propose to do about all the Muslims who misunderstand Islam and conclude that their highest religious duty is to slaughter unbelievers and hypocrites. Here your answer will surely be, well, we'll just keep insisting that they're wrong. 
We'll keep saying that they don't represent us. We'll keep marginalizing them. Two problems with this answer. First, jihadis don't care what you say about them because they regard you as heretics. When you throw out some of the clearest commands of Allah and Muhammad because you don't like them, you become just as much of a target as the rest of us because the Quran commands Muslims to wage jihad not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites. Second, you've been saying that jihadis don't represent you for years. You've been marginalizing them for years. How's that working out for you? Why is this list of Islamic terrorist attacks so long if your denial and marginalization tactics are effective? You should know by now that your tactics aren't working at all. So, do you have a plan B? Do you have any ideas, any ideas whatsoever, about how to stop these attacks? If the answer is no, if you have no plan for dealing with jihad, apart from insisting that it has nothing to do with Islam, let me tell you what I'm hearing from you right now. The message I'm hearing from westernized Muslims sounds like this. Our religion is growing rapidly. It's a peaceful religion, but our most trusted sources are filled with violent commands that are easy to misunderstand if you don't radically reinterpret them to bring them in line with Western values. Unfortunately, because some Muslims don't reinterpret them, there's a sizable and growing number of jihadis who want to slaughter as many of you as possible. Moreover, there's absolutely nothing we can do to stop the growth of this violent movement. However, if you're at all concerned about the spread of our religion, a religion that always comes with a misinformed but uncontrollably violent element, you're a racist and a bigot. If I'm missing something here, please enlighten me in the comments section. In the meantime, to all my westernized Muslim friends out there, I hope you see why many of us find your response to terrorism less than comforting. Well, there you have it. 40,000 terrorist attacks and what we should have learned from them. What's the response from politicians and journalists and educators and entertainers and Muslim organizations in the United States and Canada and Europe? But David, what about Anders Breivik? What about that guy who shot a bunch of Muslims in New Zealand? What about the other two or three terrorist attacks that we can think of that were carried out by non-Muslims? Surely the occasional terrorist attack from a non-Muslim shows that the 40,000 terrorist attacks carried out in the name of Allah since 9-11 have nothing to do with Islam. And that's the sort of willful stupidity that keeps the world from dealing with the problem, which is Muhammad. If the world would just stop being willfully stupid, Muhammad would be ridiculed into oblivion. Instead, they protect him and attack anyone who criticizes him. But I'm not going to end on a sad note. I'm going to end on a positive note. While there's much that hasn't changed in the 20 years since 9-11, and while there's much that's become even worse in the 20 years since 9-11, there's something that has changed for the better. Something amazing, something epic. 20 years ago, it was pretty rare to hear from ex-Muslims. It was pretty rare to hear about Muslims leaving Islam. Generally, the people who left Islam didn't want to draw attention to themselves. Leaving Islam was rare enough that Muslims circulated the myth that no one ever leaves Islam. Today, 20 years later, you don't hear that myth very much because ex-Muslims are everywhere. I can't go online without hearing from ex-Muslims. I can't open my email without hearing from ex-Muslims. There are millions of ex-Muslims living in Muslim countries. Muslim apologists are panicking because of all the Muslims who are leaving Islam. They're calling it an avalanche of apostasy. So while Islamic terror is endless, so is Islamic apostasy. The difference is that the apostasy is growing much more rapidly than the terror.
Do the math. How's Islam going to be doing 20 years from now?